I think. Ended up being, I did uh, eight inches for the length of the square. So you stack two pieces up, one on top of the other. So you mark the first one at four inches, you put the next piece four inches. Heisenberg, so clamp them together, and then you mark four inches over here. And you use your standard. Come right down in. And when this edge is flush and this edge is flush, you're done. Mm -hmm. When you flip it over, then you know that I am. Then when you flip it over, we know that you don't know anything about it. It's a lot of things to match. I had some bad plywood that I bought and it had a bad veneer on it. Yeah. So I got it all painted and sanded, everything was perfect. It's the first time I've ever seen it. It's going to be set around. It's going to be set around. It's going to be set around. Okay. So there's the paddle blades. This is the red oak. It's cedar and hemlock all the way out. Okay. And they're different thicknesses, so I can glue them all together and then run them through the corner, which is the proper length. Nice. So, let's see, some more of the pictures. I was going to say, Carol's joking. Yeah. 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 George. George Horvath. Okay. You look familiar to me. I was trying to just looking down and you faintly see the line right there. But now I can bend that and that's probably the ball way around it. I have to push the shorts. One side of that other, but it won't break at that joint. I've tried. You're the one who put it there. Maybe. No. I said the only place I ever students as, as well as graduates with uh, employers. George works with, with Northwestern Energy um, um, and at that scale, at the grid scale, a lot of times things become a little bit political and I know a lot of times you, you sort of get the, you know, Northwestern Energy's done this now, et cetera, et cetera, they don't care. Um, George is one of the good guys, I'll just, I'll just let you know that right off the bat. Um, and even, even um, Bob Rowe, who I think catches a lot of flack sometimes, um, he has to make tough decisions all the time. I've met Bob a few times, and I know for a fact that he's you know, trying to do the right thing in terms of keeping costs low, and keep, in terms of environmental responsibility, in terms of safety. So he's got a lot of balls in the air as well. Um, one thing that Northwestern Energy started a few years ago was a smart grid project. Anybody not heard of the smart grid before? Okay. Perfect. Well, this is this is you're in the right place. Um, in the spring, our plan is to offer an actual smart grid course, and just like you know your your smartphone, you know it's got a lot of extra bells and whistles. But the idea is to make life easier for the consumer. It's more or less the same thing from smart grid. Uh, there's efficiencies built in, et cetera, et cetera. So George is going to talk about that. I'm, I'm hoping George can also spend just a little bit time telling me telling us about your background too. George is a 
is an engineer. He grew up in Montana, went to school back east, came came back to Montana to, to raise his family. So, you know, a lot of these students are, are sitting where you and I were uh, uh -huh. 20 years ago. So I think having that kind of perspective would help help as well. So with, with that, I'll, I'll give the floor to George. And, Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Yeah, I can certainly talk a little bit about my background. Actually, I went to high school right here in Missoula, graduated from Sentinel, which is right next door, and then went off to school uh, back east, uh, completed four years in an electrical engineering uh, field, got, got that degree, was able to come back to Montana and go to work, well, right here in Missoula, working for, at the time, Montana Power. And so I worked as an engineer on staff here at the company doing uh, local the things that the local office is doing, line extension, serving customers, uh, running power to homes and businesses, both here in Missoula, down the valley, Hamilton, out west, Plains and Thompson Falls, uh, designing the power lines, uh, troubleshooting when problems came. I, as an engineer, I designed the new facilities. I was there to answer questions and, and troubleshoot problems. I wasn't the field technician planning the poles, extending the conductors, and so on. Um, and I gradually moved on to different things in the company. And now today, I'm involved in the field where we're adding technology to our distribution system. We're putting things that are, are all grouped together in this smart grid world into uh, distribution. Uh, the, the wires could serve uh, this community and run from substations out to homes have been in place for decades. But now if we add technology, communications and, and uh, computer technology, IT technology, information technology to the system, could we enhance its reliability? Could we enhance its ability to operate more efficiently? Could we save customers energy and costs? So these are the kind of things that the new smart grid world is bringing, making available to us. And you know, I know that you, as a class, I know you're doing things with um, uh, uh, energy, renewables, sun, wind, I'm not sure, wind, but I see the propeller blade in the back of there. Yeah. Um, so all these things are part of the new world, integrating uh, renewables into the grid, making things more efficient. And we're on our side doing similar things because we want to participate in all this. So this presentation I have here today is uh, basically is a snapshot of the type of things we're doing. So um, Northwestern Energy and New Technology. My little clicker here. Uh, this is a simplified overview of, of pretty much a utility system. With the generation on the left, you know, our portfolio is mostly hydro right now that we acquired the, the, uh, the dams here a year ago. We've got some coal and we have wind. We've got natural gas generation as well. And the power is generated and runs through substations and then out on distribution lines through transformers to feed businesses and homes. Uh, there's manual switches out there, so if problems occur, we can switch power from one feeder to another and thereby enhance reliability. Uh, and we deliver uh, a voltage to our system you know, in the 115 to 120 range to give good voltage, good supply to customers. But in this new world, there's some, uh, you know, more automation being, more technology added to substations. We've got uh, potentially electric cars coming. That's probably not so much in Montana right now, but in other places it's a, it's, it's coming. They're a real load to the system. The system wasn't necessarily designed to handle. Oops, here we are. Uh, so pho photovoltaics on homes, um, more efficient use of our delivery voltage, and I'll talk more about that on a different slide to provide more uh, energy savings or efficiency to customers as well as ourselves. Microgrids for reliability, automated switches for reliability, we'll talk more about that. But the new world's going to have more of these things in it, and as a utility, all utilities have to um, come up to a level to, to work with all these things. So um, all these automated things represented by the green boxes at the top. Um, if we're going to talk to these 
out on the system, we need to develop a communication network to reach out and, and touch those devices. And then we've got to bring the data back to a system that can uh, integrate that and control and operate to all these devices. And I'll talk more about the type of things that this can do to enhance um, reliability, increase efficiency on uh, some subsequent slides. But there's a whole lot of uh, infrastructure that needs to be built in this world to add devices out on the field. Because right now the system is just designed to carry electricity. But now if it has to also be involved in the information world, now there's a whole other layer that's added to the system. I'll digress for a minute. We recently participated in a four or five year project uh, to test smart grid devices, uh, along with 10 other utilities across the Pacific Northwest. We, uh, the whole system worked as a, as a whole to integrate renewables into the grid on a regional scale. Say wind was prevalent in Washington, how could we use that wind energy in Montana? That kind of thing was being tested. And, but in the process, each utility got to test other things. We tested a couple of reli a reliability initiative uh, and an energy conservation initiative, um, along with some time we used pricing for our customers. And I'll get into that more on another slide. But, so we did just finish this five-year test. And with this information, what are we going to do with it going forward? So, as I mentioned, we, oh no, this, sorry, this is, we're now looking forward 2014 to 2022. We want to extend a communication system out across our system so that we can start plugging in these smart electronic devices out on our distribution network, as well as controlling them and augmenting them to the system. So that's the initiative we just started. Um, distribution system integrity program is what that VSIP stands for. So one of the projects that we're just now beginning this year, the team I'm working with, and I'm, I mentioned this at the beginning, I'm part of a team where we're adding technology to the distribution network. I've got two other engineers working for me, and they're working on this project to integrate a solar photovoltaic system and a battery system uh, in a small little subdivision near Deer Lodge. And we're looking at trying to um, evaluate such, such things as um, increased reliability for that. Um, and I've got that, and plus some other things. The next slide will show that a little better. Uh, we can also um, provide some other services, which I'll describe on this, <coughs> on the next slide after this then. <laughs> Evaluation, and then there's the, the system that has to control it all. I think those slides got reversed here. This, this was kind of a team effort on the on the PowerPoint, wasn't it? This is the same one you gave in Bozeman, or correct? Yeah, correct. <laughs> we put this PowerPoint together so somebody else could present it, yeah. and this is the first time I've actually presented from this. And I would reverse the slides. I think so we'll talk about this. slide in here that actually showed the picture of it. The battery project that we're doing is, you know, solar, <clears throat> you know, let me, I'm sorry. Let me so, talk about it at the end in case the slides are at the end. There you go. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to just, you just want to look at all the slides right now? Maybe it's in there in slide sorter view. Would that help? That could help, if it's yes. In there, yeah, I can, yeah. I can get you in there. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, not a problem. You know, it's, uh, Happens to me frequently. I'd rather talk about it with the slides. Oh, yeah. Without the, uh, okay, well, it's true. 
Shirley at the end? Okay. Shirley P. It's, it's Shirley down here. So let's just keep going where we were. It's a, it's okay. A, I was mistaken. It's at the end. And so we can go back to where we were. And keep working. That's okay. Yep. okay. Thank you. Sorry about no, that. Oh, no, no. Okay. So I'll talk more about the battery project and what it's doing. Um, the end. So uh, we're also working on putting together this software system. That's our another project we have over the next two years. We want to buy this central software system to actually control it. Uh, utilities all have <coughs> operations and control centers where they control in real time the generation that comes on the system, all the transmission lines, and the substations. If outages occur, there's operators sitting there that can react to it. There's a certain amount of automation in the system that isolates faults and problems. And then certain automation that's already in place on the transmission system that can reroute power, I'll just use that term, and, and, and bring things back online and maintain the system. And there's operators watching it on a 24-7 basis. But the distribution world doesn't have that. The distribution world is the world that I operate in. The transmission system has a generation you know, far away from Missoula. It comes in on high voltage lines. In, in Montana, it's 100,000 volts, 115,000 volts, 161,200. 30,000 volts. Those are our typical lines for Montana. We've also stepped down to 69,000 volts. But in town, we bring that high voltage into a few key substations and then transform it down to 12,470 volts, which runs up and down the streets and alleys of Missoula. And then that goes to transformers on the pole, which transform it down to 12240. So this management system that I'm talking about here is the control center type system for this distribution network. Say we have um, switches out there we can remotely control. A power outage occurs, we can reroute power with that. We can um, adjust the system to operate more efficiently. That's the type of control center software that we're going to be bringing online in the next few years. Um, and then someday may uh, bring it up to a full control center. <coughs> so, one of the things we tested is this reliability um, scheme. And this is part of the project we did, the pilot project in Helena. And the numbers here represent customers between switches. The, uh, the circles are switches. The, the square box is a breaker at a substation. These are 12,470 volt circuits. And we've got 400 customers approximately between the substation breaker and that first switch where we can isolate the power. And that's what this grid, this slide represents. So let's say a car hits a pole on circuit 46. All the customers are out of power. 1,100 customers are out of power. Um, what happens today? A lineman gets called at night. who has to go out, assuming this happened at night. He goes out, assesses the problem, makes the local area safe. And then he says, let's get all the other customers back on that we can. So he would open this switch and then go up to either the green or the brown circuit or the red circuit and close in the rest of the customers. Maybe that would take two hours. And then he goes back and starts working on the problem. But if we could automate that so that the system could recognize that the problem occurred between the substation and this first switch, the system could open that device for us and then the system could analyze, OK, which one of these other circuits, the green, the brown, or the red, is this load best served from, and make that decision within you know, under a minute. And bring, in this example, 800 customers back on, 300 are out. Now the lineman shows up, and he can concentrate on working on the problem and, and not the uh, restoration side of it. And we uh, actually are doing this in Helena on these four circuits. We had um, three outages in the test period, and each one of them brought the customers back on in, under, in about a minute time frame, um, isolating the sections similar to this. So how does that translate into savings for customers across the state? You know, we, we came up with a 53% of the um, on this pilot project, 
we save 53% of the customer interruption minutes. So all the customers that were having a power outage, let's say 100 of us had an outage for one hour, that's 60 minutes, that's 6,000 CMI, customer minutes interruption. That would, would it, but if, um, but if that was saved, there, there would be zero CMI. So we use um, the Helena figures to take what if we built the system like we had in Helena across all our feeders and billings. Over a four year period, we looked at outage history and determined that on average we would save about 1.3 million CMI in billings. Well, what does that really mean? Um, if we take that to an average system customer, that's what the SADI stands for, then um, a way of looking at that is, let's say, um, if, if the average customer across the state would say four minutes on an outage. Let's say, let me back up. If we all had an outage for one hour, if Missoula had an outage for one hour, then one-sixth of all our customers across the state, assuming Missoula's one-sixth, would have a, a one-hour outage. But if you average that across the whole state, the whole state, the average customer would have a 10-minute outage. So the average customer across the whole state, if we could save this, would have, we'd save four minutes average. To put this in perspective, our total system average outage duration for the average customer in the state is two hours, 120 minutes. Every year, the average person gets 120 minute outage. If we can do four minute saving in billings, and you take it across six of our major cities, that's 24 minute savings across the whole state. So now our average customer savings, instead of 120 minutes, we're down to a little under 100 minutes. So we've significantly impacted the average outage duration for our customers if we can extrapolate what we did in Helena across our six major towns in the state. And uh, we'll have to rework this slide to make that a little easier to follow. But we feel that what we did in Helena is pretty significant for reliability for our urban areas who can't quite do it in our small rural towns or even towns like, you know, low, low Florence, uh, there's just not enough other feeders, circuits to transfer load to. But in an urban area like Missoula, it's, uh, we could, with, well, it's significant investment, but we could improve reliability on across the state with this. Energy savings. And of course, this graphic isn't the best either, but in a nutshell, we provide voltage to our customers in the range of from 126 volts on the high end to 114 on the low end. That's the band we're supposed to be in uh, to meet the ANSI standards and, and the state has adopted that. So that's what we have to live in. But in practical terms, that usually translates in to 118 to 124. That's where we supply voltage to most of our customers. If the substation end is closer to 124, near the end of the line is about 118. If we can reduce that range to you know, 114 and a half to 120, we can provide some energy savings for our customers as well as for ourselves on our lines. For example, um, energy savings on appliances. If we pick, well, let's just use the ones with the circles for right now. Um, this one's a refrigerator. The refrigerator is designed to operate, excuse me, the refrigerator is served power at 120 volts. We'll use the 120 volt base, not the 240 volt base, because most refrigerators are 120 volts. If we take that refrigerator and supply it with 115 volts, it's going to use 10% less energy, according to this report. When you continue to lower the voltage on the refrigerator, it uses less and less energy. I question <coughs> this piece of it, though, because I don't think it's going to work real well if you supply it with 100 volts. Um, I think the data is better. Let's take the three-phase motor. Three-phase motor, if you supply it with 120 volts, it's going to use one unit of energy. 
if you supply it with 115 volts, the three phase motor will use point. Whoa. Yeah, the, smart the, board. the smart board will get you too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hey, getting well. everybody. Uh, yeah. I think. Okay, I won't touch the board. <laughs> the three phase motor, notice its energy consumption is dropped 0.996 at 115 volts. Once the voltage continues to drop to 110, the energy consumption goes up, and it's going up as the voltage drops. It goes up as the voltage increases. And so you can see kind of this uh, inverted bell-shaped curve where the, volt, the energy consumption of that motor is optimized at the 115 volt level in this example. And why is that? Why would that be? Any ideas? Surges. Surges? Well, actually, um, if you think about the motor and you think about its nameplate, that motor probably says right on the nameplate 115 volts. And in this new world of everything's optimized and designed to be as efficient as possible, every excess thing is taken out of the motor so that it runs perfectly at 115 volts, then if you raise the voltage or lower the voltage from the optimal design level, it's going to be less and less efficient. And that's exactly what this is, is showing, this data on this three-phase motor shows. And it pretty much follows with most of these devices that most things that you buy on the nameplate says 115 volts or 110 volts, that's where they're going to be most efficient. But if because of how we configure our system, we supply it with you know a few volts higher than that, it's going to be slightly less efficient than optimal. But if we can configure our system to lower the voltage to closer to the optimum nameplate rating, it will run more efficiently. So we can help our customers with that. And so that's the name of this, that's the whole purpose of this volt bar optimization, the VDO, to, to provide that energy savings. Um, how's this done on our system? You know, a substation sends out voltage of the at one level and then the voltage drops represented by the black graph that black line to, to the end of the line where the customers are at and we normally most utilities always operate this way they, they maintain a relatively not it's not high voltage it's on the higher end of that band so that we have um, we're always in the band at the end of the line even under contingencies <coughs> But we can lower the voltage with the with technology and with equipment if we add what are known as capacitors along the line to raise the voltage. The voltage graph could get transformed something like that orange brown line. Because it's high at the end, that enables us to lower it at the substation to get the end voltage about the same as where it was. If we add a voltage regulator in the middle of the line to boost the voltage up further, now that enables us to lower it at the substation again. And then if we can add a, what's called a smart meter at the end of the line where we can actually sense the end of the line voltage and not let it go below that ANSI minimum, and now we have an actual indicator, a meter at the end, we could take the substation voltage and bury even lower and now the whole circuit from the substation is following this blue line. All customers have a, a relatively low voltage, still above the 114 ANSI limit, as opposed to this dotted black line where most customers have several volts higher. And we're only talking two, three volts, but two, three volts could make a big difference in energy savings. Um, in fact, how big a difference? Our testing in Helena showed that 1% reduction in voltage, you know, 1% reduction in 120 volts is 1.2 volts. That's, that resulted in, based on our measurements, about a 0.8% energy savings. It's not huge, but um, taken across a whole circuit, from a, a society perspective, an aggregator perspective, that does add up. Uh, we took one feeder in Bozeman, and based on the numbers, you know, 
we'd say, if we applied this on this feeder, this technology, with the Helena savings, that's 181 kilowatt hours per year that the average customer would save. At 10 cents a kilowatt hour, that would amount to $1.81 of savings per year. Um, is that really, you know, what is that worth to the average customer? Probably not much on a one customer basis, but from a societal perspective, um, maybe that has value, probably does. But it costs the utility money to, to add those devices and the equipment to the line to bring the voltage down like that. So let's say it would cost us um, whatever amount to put out there that would raise everybody's utility bill a dollar per year. So if we can save a dollar eighty-one per year in energy from your utility bill, but we would raise it, on the other hand, a dollar per year, every customer would have an eighty-one cent savings. So does that make sense to do? Probably, but it, but it's going to take some hurdles to get it through, and we're still looking at the data and so on. And these are just numbers we we gained from our analysis. So the battery project. So this is a typical net metered customer. Uh, the red line here represents the energy use uh, during the day, uh, each during the day, and the green line represents the energy production from their photovoltaic system. So during the day when the sun comes up, if the energy comes up and it's greater than the red line, which is what's being consumed, anything below the red line is energy going into the house. So at night, there's no sun, all the energy is going into the house. This red shaded area represents the energy going into the house. During the day, the photovoltaic overcomes that and supplies energy back into the grid. And so this is just an example of how the day-night cycle would occur for a home but or for a net metered customer. But the system was never designed for this two-way flow. It can handle it. Uh, if the reverse flow exceeds the this flow, then the system was designed for this capacity, and now we're, well, in this example, maybe four times greater capacity going in the opposite direction. The system wasn't necessarily designed for that. So it adds costs, challenges to a utility to do this. And I, we can talk more about net metering if you want to, but the, the point here is that, the point that we want to test is, let's say if we could take this peak and instead of pushing it all into the grid, we could push this, you know, half of it into battery storage. Now, the energy flow to this customer would be, you know, this much into the house and this much out of the house into the system. The rest from here up would be flowing into the battery. So the net effect on the system is, you know, no greater in this direction than it was energy flow in this direction. If you see what I'm saying, this peak can go into a battery. Then if this peak can go into the battery during the day, at night when the customer is pulling power, the battery could push power into the house and even lower this at night. Um, so you can do things with the battery if you if you can put batteries out there with the PV system, you can take you can lessen the strain on the system and do other things. You can shave peaks. You can save money in other ways. So we want to test that. So near Deer Lodge, we have a uh, site that we're leasing, and we're actually going to construction in the next few weeks to start building this. And it's. Um, represents, a, it's a small system, 80 kW worth of battery storage and 40, 50 kW worth of um, solar PV um, with the system. And we've got two large solar arrays, well, large, um, I forget the dimensions, but like 100, 100 feet by whatever the width of an array is, um, 10, 12 feet. I, um, 
one of the engineers worked for me that's, he's all over the project. I'm a little bit further away from the project. So in a nutshell, um, we also want to test reliability of this system. So we're calling the microgrid. <clears throat> We've got a switch here on the system. The utility source is the substation in Deer Lodge, and way out on the end of this rural feeder off of one tap, we have 17 customers in this residential neighborhood. So we're putting this microgrid out there. So during the, um, the day, the photovoltaic charges the battery, and then the excess power goes into the system. Then um, how does the microgrid work? If a fault or an outage occurs on the line upstream from that switch, let's call the recloser, uh, everybody goes out of power and the inverters drop off because of the IEEE 1547. And so everybody's in the dark, including these 17 customers and this little microgrid site. And then the microgrid the automation does a check, verifies that the fault was here and the switch did not see the fault in the subdivision. So that if that's all true, then the system opens this switch and then turns on the batteries. And then when the batteries are back on, uh, the, the inverters for the solar voltaic kick back in. And now we're serving the 17 customers off the batteries. And during the day when there's sunlight, augmenting it with solar. So we're testing that technology or going to be. So how about when the power comes back on? Our safety check is that um, we won't close the system into the microgrid because that would damage the microgrid. So when source power is available, we verify that the microgrid, but we won't make that close. We de-energize the microgrid, then close the system back up, and then, and then we re-energize the and we re-energize the microgrid. Sorry about that. I don't have the next graphic that shows power flowing back out of here. But so that's what we're going to be testing. And I think, oh yeah, my last slide. This this is a doozy of a slide. <laughs> the reason I like this slide is because it's a doozy of a slide. It's a it, it shows you the possibilities and the opportunities and the the huge amount of things that um, that there are out there in this new world with quote unquote smart grid. It doesn't show you any great details. It just shows that, whoa, there's a lot of things in this new world. Mm -hmm. The old world was we've got generation that's not represented up on the slide. We've got transmission that takes power to substations, <coughs> which takes power through distribution lines, the poles and transformers, and then through a meter into the house. And that's the old world. The new world puts technology on top of it. It puts um, all these devices in a home. You know, it puts smart thermostats, thermostats you can control remotely off of a smartphone, thermostats that, uh, like the Nest thermostat, which actually learns your behavior and adjusts things. Uh, <coughs> being able to set your uh, temperature in your home before you come home, or, oh, I'm gonna be away extended today, let me make sure that thermostat stays low. Um, it allows the utility to work with the customer. Let's say we need power during the day uh, because loads are, are coming up, generation resources are tight. Do we add another generation resource that costs a lot of money? Or do we um, go to our customers and say, we'll buy energy from you. Don't use this next bit uh, for the next hour here. Uh, let's set your thermostats back. If we can do that with uh, communication and IT technology, we can, it's a win-win for all. So there's a lot of technology that's added in the homes uh, with smart meters, which we don't have meters on our system like this um, at this time, but the meter data could be made available so customers can use it to manage their power. Uh, utilities can use it to help work with customers to have that win-win situation of let's pay you as a customer to uh, use less during this hour so that we don't have to bring that expensive generator on and so on. And there's so many things added to the distribution network, switches, voltage controllers, and all these things that we can, if we could talk to in real time, we could make more the system more efficient. And all that stuff out on the line requires a behind the scenes 
information technology infrastructure that's amazing. Servers and databases, hardware networking, uh, software systems, as well as communication and people to manage it all and, um, and operate it all. Uh, the world is only growing in all these things and, and that's what this slide represents. Uh, nothing specific, it just, whoa, there's a lot out there. So with that, I think that's my last slide. So any questions? So we, uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Yeah. Yes. Are you guys a co-op or are you a uh, corporation? We're an investor-owned corporation. Uh, Missoula Electric Co-op, which is up uh, off of Broadway near Russell Street, they're the utility in town that's the co-op, and they have some rural loads out west and down south near Lolo, as well as east of here up in Potomac. So and we kind of, we have the major center of town. And, and is, is it true, do I understand it correctly, so if you're in a uh, municipality, Northwestern Energy is your default provider. If you're outside, then you're on a co-op. Is that more or less accurate? Uh, to a degree, yes. Yeah. And we have rural circuits as well. So um, the rural is kind of chopped up between us and the co-op. Okay. But that's usually the way it, the way it lands. Yes. Uh, so uh, I know I've, I've seen your Helena presentation before. Um, the Bozeman one, was, I don't believe that was in the last time you came and gave one of your talks. When are you implementing that? on a base smart grid any other places or is that just another singular uh, test? When I did the presentation on Helena before we were actively involved in the pilot project and that was our focus mm -hmm. and now that's kind of getting behind us and now we're starting to look at some other things uh, that we talked about in this presentation so uh, we're, we want to take the Helena learning and take it elsewhere and we're on the cusp of beginning to do that. And uh, why do you cite it in Deer Lodge for your PV microgrid? Oh, that's a good question. We wanted to find a, a utility circuit, a rural circuit that had outages on it, because uh, we want to test that, um, that that reliability portion of it. So we found a circuit that had a reasonable amount of outages on it, so in the next five years we could have a few. Um, so that was one reason. We also wanted it someplace where it had some visibility. So this site location is right near the interstate. So as you drive past into Deer Lodge, on the Missoula side of Deer Lodge, it'll be on the right-hand side near the Beck Hills Road exit. Construction will start, I think, in July and then into August, and it should be up and running by October. So that was the other reason, some visibility. And it just it worked out well for the 17 homes when it comes out in the wash I imagine? We hope it will. Uh, the 17 homes, we went and knocked on their doors, talked to them all. They're excited about it, and it, it'll be interesting to see what they think about it, you know, in a couple of years after we. So, what uh, we use the metric CMI correct for customer net? Yes. Yeah. What was that? That <coughs> was that line double what people in Missoula see for the the rural outages like that? Or I, I mean, don't, I don't know the exact number, but uh, it it would be easily double what the person in Missoula sees. Yes. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, do you foresee a time when uh, Northwest Energy would be able to have um, enough lines or whatever is necessary to be able to actually cut checks to people that are supplying energy through renewable resources? Um, yes, it, depending on how it, it's, um, it's all valued. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you're you're yeah. jumping like. 20 steps ahead. Yeah. It's, it's a really complex subject because it, it, it's it, 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 it is a complex subject. You know, uh, Future time. It is, and, and, even, and it is happening today. We do have those generators out there that there's a contract or an arrangement made that um, it's, and we um, we do pay for that power. So there are those arrangements out there today. Yes. So instead of having one long power outage with the battery system, would you have the one where the power originally goes out and then a second one when you're turning it off before the plant supplies more power? Yeah, that's a good question. That's exactly right. Because we, uh, 
because of the IEEE 1547 rule with the <coughs> batteries um, and so on, the inverter, well, let me simplify this. Yes, simple answer is yes. Power goes out, it does its safety check, and then it opens the switch and re-energizes. And because of that, we have to have a similar power outage when the system power comes back on. So those customers will experience you know, a very short outage as opposed to a two hour outage. Or two weeks. Yeah. Well, the battery won't last two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> the sunlight will during the day. All those uh, gadgets to reduce like the smart grid, mm -hmm. if you were to put those in every home, how would the resources take to build all those compared to the amount of resources it takes just for a little bit more coal? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a really good question, too. And, you know, um, I think well, during lunch we were kind of touching on a little bit of that kind of a topic. And, you know, does it make s We will eventually get there. Eventually, Thermostats in all the homes will become more and more smarter and they'll work with all these things. And I think as a society, we need to go <coughs> that direction. But then the real question is, how much do we want to make it happen today uh, versus letting it run its course, so to speak? And there may be values to a society to force it, encourage it, speed it up. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a great question to balance the economics of it all, too. I think we will all be getting here, but how quick do we want to make it happen? Some of these things that will have good paybacks, and we will want to spend the money to do it. Is so, there any um, future plans to update your meters anytime soon, so you can see a lot more of this uh, um, voltage end line and um, usage per house that on that certain circuit? From a technology perspective, I'd love to see us get there because we could do some things like that. From an economic perspective, right now I'm not sure if it makes good sense for our customers. In the late 90s, we went and updated the older technology meters to a what was um, current in that time, but it wasn't the two-way what we have today. And so to, when we do our studies now and look at at the benefit, the incremental benefit, it's not quite there to make it make sense. If we still had the old, old previous technology, it would be a slam dunk. But it, again, they can write on that. Yeah. We got a question then. Mm -hmm. uh, this might not be on this topic. Mm -hmm. are, are you uh, familiar with your arrangement with uh, Big Wind Farms? Uh, we're taking a trip to Judith Gap next mm -hmm. week. What's the what's your side of the relationship like with Inver Energy? With um, and I'm not in the energy supply side, okay. so I don't know you know the details for sure. But they're cus not a customer. They're a generator that we buy power oh, from. Yeah. So whatever they generate, we buy. And I don't know the exact arrangement of that contract. But the thing about wind energy is it's intermittent, as you know. Whatever they generate, whenever they generate it, we buy, but we can't control it. If we need generation and they obviously can't supply it, then we've got to make it up somewhere else. So the past two years or so, three years ago, we built um, the Dave Gates Generating Station in, in Anaconda, three gas fire turbines. And part of the reason for building that is because of wind generation like Judith Gap, where we've got to make up the difference so when Judith Gap goes down, other generation goes down, we fire up gas turbines to fill the gap. Okay. So, but we buy power from the Judith Gap facility and right. a few others in the state. Okay. Yeah. What about all the little guys? You have to buy their power? To, and uh, there's a law called, I think it's PURPA? Uh, I don't remember what it is. Uh, stands for, but it kind of, quote unquote, uh, I don't want to use forces. Well, I don't, maybe that is the right word. It forces utilities to buy from the small generators like that. And so we've got, I don't, and I'm not on the energy supply side. I know. We do have quite a number of those on our facilities. So yeah, we are buying power from those types of facilities. And from a societal perspective, that's probably the right thing to do, but it's not the cheapest power we have. In fact, it's probably one of the most expensive. So okay. from an economic perspective, it, 
from that perspective, it may not be the best decision, but overall, it's probably the right thing to do. Okay. We drive by a bunch of little farms getting rid of the big farms. Yeah, like yes. Yes. View. Yeah. They have their, uh, what is that, uh, small power production facility, correct? I don't know if there's turtles in the court in the UK or not. Or uh, that one that's like 9.6. We'll drive by the one that's yeah, like six turbines, the six like 1.5 GE turbines that they put on that ranch, right on a ridge. You'll see them. Is it's that in Great Falls? One, yeah, it's somewhere. I don't know if it's called Golden View or between between White Sulphur and uh, Harlowton on the right. Oh, um, I well, that's, that's Golden View. That's right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, so there are a few there already. So, oh, yeah. so that's the, the one that got grandfathered oh. into the small power production. There you go. Okay. So what, whereas 10 megawatts now it's down to three in Montana. And not all those are not necessarily really expensive. I mean, yeah. Some might be a good price. I don't know those yeah. details. You don't know the dollar yeah. details. Yeah. Yeah. That's just it's too much. Yeah. That's a lot of time spent. Yeah. So, so we are buying from those smaller facilities. All utilities have to because to meet certain laws and things. So. Okay, one more question. All right, George, thanks so much. Yes, Uh, so while I've got you all here, um, just one, one point, if you are um, if you walk away from your workstation, log off, uh, if, if, if you leave a computer sitting open, you're, you're not only leaving your own information vulnerable to someone, but you're, you're really leaving the entire network vulnerable. So, well, you're also wasting energy because <laughs> your, your, your apps are sitting there running, the computers, and this room gets hot, I just, I just over there, Yesterday, I put a bunch of computers to sleep, but I realized they're over there cooking in the room there, unfortunately. But just be mindful of that when you're, when you're done with the com computer using it for the time being. Put it to sleep, turn it off, whatever you need to do. Um, so this afternoon, we are going to, uh, well, Jonathan, you're here this afternoon, right? So we're going to head down to uh, Mobash Skate Park. Corner Mobash and, and Orange Street, we're going to launch the Micro Hydro. Nice. I'll be there by about 2, 1.45 or 2. Nobody gets in the water until I'm there. Um, I think we're all set for presentations. I invited a lot of people for Friday. We're going to start off with coffee at 10 in AD01 right next door. It's really important Friday that you actually, if you want to eat lunch, that you bring your own lunch. Uh, if, you're on, if you're eating at the food zoo, they're going to provide brown bag lunches, but we don't have a catered service or funds for anything like that. So if you want to eat lunch on Friday, bring your own brown bag lunch. We're going to eat between noon and 12.30 after we wrap up our formal presentations and before we, we show our technology. So that's, um, that's Friday. We'll start at 10, four half hour talks and then an hour and a half for show and tell in, in, the, in the back lot here. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to review everybody's PowerPoint and everybody will work with them one-on-one. -on -one. That's all in the syllabus too, so take a look where your, where your time is. Um, use this afternoon to collect whatever remaining data you need to. Um, use this evening to finish up your reports and your PowerPoints. And tomorrow morning, I'll sit down and um, make sure there's not too many bloopers or spelling errors or decimal errors, things like that. Cassie Hemphill is also going to come and give a talk uh, at the same time tomorrow. Extremely important that you attend that because she's going to tell you how to give a nice talk. So you don't get your slides out of work. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, so that, so that, that's tomorrow, too. So um, anyway, um, again, I'm really proud of all the hard work you guys put in. I'm really impressed. It's one of the best practices um, I, I've seen yet. So uh, back to work and we'll uh, see you in the second. Yeah, we'll see if we can do a great for you and get down there. We're not going to drive up there. We're going to go down to the
Spin it. Spin it. Works. Yeah, we'll just put one uh, water wheel on and yeah. kind of look down and see what the sea of the activity will drive it. Yeah. 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 We had to really increase our, our projects more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the micro hydro team. Uh -huh. so this is one half of their project. They build a controlling motor. Uh -huh.